there from Cambodia. I'm Heather Graham, an actor and an activist. About 11 years ago, I met a very impressive Australian, Scott Neeson, on a yoga retreat. Scott was a movie mogul overseeing budgets of hundreds of millions of dollars and the promotion of blockbusters all around the world. But he threw it all away to start a very different life in Cambodia. This is his story. I've always felt like you've only got this one life to live and I feel like I've had three, you know, three acts so far. I did the Hollywood thing, I, I accomplished more than what I ever expected and it just didn't work for me. It wasn't what it promised. Today's a garage sale. It's um, all the stuff I owned from my previous life in the film business. Oh, what's in there? Well, you got an sheet and Yeah, just around the corner sheet. there to the right, yep. Five bedrooms worth of very expensive and very beautiful things were sprinkled over backyard, front yard, inside the house, and everywhere you could turn. It would be part of the furniture, but it'd be 300 each. He wanted to be lighter. He wanted to be weightless. I'm shocked by the amount of stuff I had. And you look at it and you think, oh my God, I paid this much for it. And then this choice. <gasps> oh, on the front porch. On the yes. front porch. A lot of people around him and Scott himself probably figured he was having a midlife crisis. It's for sale in Beverly Hills of three and a half thousand. How many people do you know who have everything they want at their fingertips and will just sell all that off and just trade it for garbage? Scott was living the dream. He was a handsome, single man in Los Angeles, California. He was dating models. He had it all. He lived next to Cindy Crawford, and it all was happening there. But there was obviously something that wasn't really making him happy inside. There is an ongoing feeling in America that you're deserving of more and more material things. Once you get this new Porsche, you'll be happy. You'll be happier. And once you get the boat in the marina, you'll be even happier. And when you finally get the house with the mansion and you have this beautiful girlfriend, you'll be really happy. And it was all lies. He was promoted to head of marketing for Fox International. So that meant that he was marketing films to the world. I think his greatest achievement was Titanic. Titanic did extraordinarily well, and he really made his name. When we did Braveheart with Mel, for example, he has his private jet. He'd land in um, Milan. We had lunch with Giorgio Armani. Harrison Ford's one I remember well. He was so much fun, and he could drink too. <laughs> extremely successful. He'd had parties at his house in Brentwood, and he was a very wealthy guy with a boat and a sports car. It was a real trip. I loved it. But then, you know, you're dealing with the other extreme, like actresses who will not get on a private plane until they know the thread count on the seats. They've got to have certain masseuses waiting for them when they arrive, and they've got to have chiropractors flown in. I finished up my time at 20th Century Fox. I'd had another offer to start at Sony Pictures. And I managed to negotiate uh, a space of time between jobs. My goal was to get a small hiatus, just to get out and cleanse my soul. Checking. You know, I had a spiritual side back then. I'd like to meditate. Um, I was very big into yoga and I wanted to stop at all the various spots that were Buddhist landmarks. I think that first trip that Scott went to Cambodia, he had this great idea that he was finally going to have the holiday of his life. He was going to go to a remote, beautiful place and see these postcard images that we all have of Cambodia. I had no clue in retrospect what it was really like out there. I really had no clue. It was in Phnom Penh that my, my world as I knew it started to disintegrate. 
this whole thing started to peel away and he saw the layers underneath of something much, much more. And I think he just started to reflect on his whole life. Scott was six and I was nine when we came to Australia. Mum and Dad came out on the, the £10 migrant scheme and we settled in Elizabeth, South Australia. It was a difficult place to grow up. It was working class, but it was fairly isolated back in 64. My mother really longed for Scotland. She never settled down. My father wasn't particularly warm. Mum and Dad had a fairly volatile marriage. There was a lot of tension in the family and I think it affected Scott and I a little differently. I sort of persevered a bit with school. I applied for and was accepted to the Australian Film and Television School in Sydney. I was pretty rebellious. I never completed the high school exams. I was considered chronic unemployed. I was sent to interview for a company called Clifford Theatres and they had drive-in theatres and they needed someone to deliver the posters and I was an assistant in the marketing department and that's how I started. Getting paid to watch movies was fun. And I think that somebody really noticed that he'd made a difference. And so before we knew it, Greater Union in town wanted to have him and then Hoyts wanted to have him. There was something he just was doing right that people were noticing and he kept being poached to the next job and the next job and the next job. moved to Sydney, I think it was in 84. My father said, don't do it, you don't go to Sydney. He felt that um, without a high school certificate, without any real qualifications, I couldn't really make it in the, in the big smoke. Before long, uh, the Hollywood lights were calling and Scott came across the pond and was the big boss. My father, my father made sure it was an anxiety-ridden period of, it won't work out, you know, it's a big city, they'll eat you alive, and um, why are you giving up such a great job in Sydney? If you come back, you won't get another job. <laughs> it was the whole thing all over again. Here we are in New York City. It took a long time to drive. And of course, being in the film industry myself and still having dreams of making films, it seemed like a ter terrific place to have a brother. I think it was very important for Scott to chase success. Scott Neeson is now Vice President of Marketing at 20th Century Fox Motion Pictures. I think at the time, it was easy to frame as just making money, having a big job, and some sort of moment of, you made it, kid. He lived and breathed the film business. And to a degree, I always found with Scott that I couldn't quite make a, a really close connection with him. He probably had been working for about 12 years non-stop without any proper holiday. And so I think he was just craving that opportunity to go out and have a holiday, not have to worry about sort of like the next box office something. When I first went to Cambodia, my vision was, in retrospect, very limited. And I stayed at the Raffles Hotel. It was really um, just this perception of being a backpack. I took a backpack, but that was about it. As he started to sort of penetrate a bit out onto the streets, there's this endless stream of children that are coming and trying to sell you something or ask for, for money. It really bothered him very deeply. I was eating out on the riverside where a lot of the beggar kids are and um, if you give them money it's going to go to someone else. Um, if you give them food or drink you've helped them for that one day. Scott met a guy in a cafe that said if you really want to help poor kids you should go to the garbage dump called Stung Men Che on the outskirts of Phnom Penh where there's a community of very poor people working there. The moment I stepped there, it was just the single most impactful moment of my life. I was standing there facing into the abyss. The smell's almost visible, it's almost tactile. There's this sudden moment when you realise it's, it's people, it's children, and they're working. 
there were kids everywhere. In some cases, been left there by parents that didn't want them. They'd be going through the rubbish looking for recyclables, metals, plastic bottles, making maybe 25 cents a day. The noise of these garbage trucks. The rubbish there includes everything from hospital garbage, body parts, fetuses, through to industrial waste, through to restaurant waste. So kids would be searching through for recyclables as well as food. It really shook me to my, to my very core. You're face to face with the fact that there's you and there's this child or this family who have no backup plan. It was either me or, or I could walk away, just turn my back and pretend I didn't see it. When he returned to L.A., he was different. His face looked different. There was, there was a light on in his eyes that I hadn't seen before. Yeah, so you'll get me on an earlier flight out of here, yeah? He was back into a jet-set lifestyle, but he took a bit of Cambodia with him. He took, I think, with him what he had seen at Stungman Chai. I was convinced I'd found my calling, but I'd seen some terrible midlife crises go down in Hollywood. And so I made myself promise that I wouldn't do anything drastic, anything rash. We're going down to um, Sting Ming Che. I was going to, um, down there for the night time where most of the garbage trucks seemed to come in. It was in July 2004. I was on a business trip and I made a side trip to Phnom Penh and I was standing on the garbage dump and my cell phone rang and it was my office in Los Angeles. And they patched through the major star of the time uh, and the star's agent. And they were very angry. They were ready to leave. Yeah. 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 They had a G5 sitting on the tarmac, but we hadn't put the right food on board the plane. The star, in this most angry, indignant manner, said to me, word for word, said, my life wasn't meant to be this difficult. And it was, it was a synthesizing moment. You know, inside of me, it all just came together. If I'd wanted, and I did want, vindication that this was where I was meant to be, if I wanted a moment that would show me just how ludicrous the Hollywood life I had was, there it was. I guess we knew that Scott was getting really serious about this when he said he was selling the house in L.A. and that he was going to sell all the things in the house as well. 60, 80, 40, I used the money to start up CCF Cambodian Children's Fund. Yeah, this, here's 540 for... Several hundred thousand of my own money into it to get it going. Just trying to work out how many kids can sleep here. I rented a building in Phnom Penh and hired my first staff member. He told me about his plan to open a school. I thought it was possible because the plan was not too big. Scotty became the Pied Piper of sorts. His daily routine consisted of getting up and heading to the dump. My plan was to get around 45 children off the garbage dump. I hadn't finished my own education. It hadn't held me back. But these kids, if they were going to get off this garbage dump, they had to do it through going to school. She wants to go to school. Yeah. Yeah. There was a magic in bringing the children to facilities that you better give them a school uniform, a school bag, and a, a schedule. Bye and we doubled in size within six months, and within the next four months, we doubled in size again. Sometimes he teased me, like, then should we open uh, center number seven, center number eight? And then I just look at him and laugh. Eight years old, run by Janine. The first time we went, 
to visit was early 2005. He just couldn't actually believe what he'd done in an incredibly short period of time. Productivity has fallen down to minimal levels. What you gonna do with all that junk? All that junk. He was energised, he was pumped, he was certainly Scott again. He wasn't playing a role of a, of a movie executive. Oh, yes, see, and go. I think it's really changed the dynamic between Norman and Scott and I. Norman and I have been making films in the area of social justice for, you know, 20 years, and all of a sudden, Scott did this huge about turn and started to do something that was just so big and amazing. You know, he was actually living this thing. We had a camera with us and naturally being filmmakers, we turned it on. And so some of those memories linger on tape now. The early days, it was a very immediate reward. It was an adrenaline rush of, of going to the dump, of, of meeting a child in need. Over the years, I've seen a fatigue and a tiredness. There's a lot of demands, so he's rarely able to, to walk around without everyone calling out his name uh, with whatever needs they might have. That's it, I think. That should be it. All right, one more, one more, one more. Does he owe money on rent? Yeah. He says he owes three months. I worry about him emotionally. He's chosen a very difficult life. I worry about his isolation and I worry about this all backing up on him. She's saying that um, she hasn't got milk to feed her baby. Oh, is this giving sugar water? Yeah, that's not going to work. The difficult part for me is is night time. You know, when there's the silence and the darkness, it's you get some some bad thoughts going through the brain. There's only the grandmother left. The father pissed off and left a six-week-old yeah, trying to sell his two daughters twice. Yeah. High-risk environment for two girls of that age. You deal with things during the day that. In fact, you don't even think they exist. I've, I've come across this physical assaults on um, six, seven-week-old babies. There's, um, you know, children as young as five or six being sold into brothels. There's, um, there's rape, abuse, um, incest going on in families. The mother of these kids is sick. She looks really sick. There was the most appalling situation of a mother who was, who was dying. She was lying on the garbage dump. I found out that she had a daughter, Tate, who I believe was about eight years old then. She'd been trying to keep the mother alive by going through the rubbish. We took the mother to a clinic and we finally got her into palliative care just outside the city where she spent her last weeks. I openly promised that you know, Tate would always be taken care of. The challenges grew because the children that he was managing to get out of the environment, they inevitably had brothers and sisters in the same position. He only had about two months of reserves. And the promise, the investment, was a lifetime promise. So he had to work and think very carefully about how he was going to sustain that promise. It was a defining moment because I had never asked people for money before. I found that I would be relying on other people's charity myself in order to keep these kids off the garbage dump and in school. How much is needed for a year? 603,000 We'll put up a third of that if someone will match. All right. Tony Robbins just donated $200,000. Donna, Karen, how much? All right, now we're talking, honey. That's what I'm talking about. Scott's a humanitarian, but he also has this side where he can get people to give him money. So in a way, 
he's this beautiful, pure-hearted man, but he also can manipulate like people into like doing what he wants, which is great. By 2009, 2010, we had this very functional education system. We had a very good relationship with all the families down there. It has become a sense of real trust. Around that time, Scott found out that there was a man who had set up a kind of a copycat activity down at the dump and that he had actually bought one of the girls from her mother. Yeah, he was a convicted pedophile in the UK. It was just too close to home that he's coming to the families of some of the children in our care who are being educated there. My idyllic organisation, it was, it was just sideswiped me. And I felt a degree of culpability because you know, I was this Western guy that would be down there and I was helping the families and I'd set up this um, trusting relationship and this guy was exploiting it. The next thing we knew, the story hit the tabloids. The British police arrived in the country. The guy fled to Thailand and he ended up in jail. Child protection is something that I'm, I'm very much driven by. I'm meeting with people in the judiciary, meeting with people I hope will put money into this, because I really want to get a better deal for these kids. I think the great thing is it's a bright light in a, in a sea of darkness, mm -hmm. really. I have a particular interest in human rights, and uh, I first went to Cambodia um, to have a look at CCF, and one of the questions in my mind was, um, uh, how safe are these children? Because at the moment they have basically the perpetrator, the child and a policeman, and each give their own versions. I felt entirely comfortable with CCF that uh, there was a great deal of effort made to ensure that these children uh, were in a safe environment and that they were kept safe. Kids come to you like magnets. You have to accept that, but at the same time, it, it gives you a huge responsibility if you are a Westerner in that situation. It's just, a lot of it's just common sense. I wasn't sure that I'm never alone with a child. My office door is never shut. Um, I've always got staff around. All the community people and as well as the, the students use God, I would say, as a living God to them. They call God Pa Pa, which means a father. So to them, Scott is like uh, their second father who, although he did not give birth to them, but he gave uh, the future to them. Scott is a very good person who 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 is a very good person. Scott's spending an enormous amount of time fundraising now because the plan keeps growing. The journey that he's been on has changed from pulling the children out of the environment to trying to improve the environment itself. Instead of just handing over cash so that the mothers and the families could be compensated, we started putting in place services that they needed and the greatest need was medical care. And so we opened a medical clinic that would treat the parents and the families for free. And then I think he was really starting to think about, well, hang on a minute, what about all the babies that are with their mothers down here? And building up ideas like that he could provide daycare or a nursery for kids while their mothers were working down there. And then why did the mothers have to work there? Can I create some work opportunities for them? All the time what you were seeing was uh, uh, practical work uh, designed to help people take control of their own lives. Well, I think he seems very fulfilled now. Like, I got all these children into school that wanted to go to school, and then I, I built these buildings. I think he's sort of like a father to, like, like 1,100 children. <laughs> Thank you.
by far, though, the biggest um, surprise was my father. He'd always been against me having children, and he said to me that I was too busy with my work and travelling to have a child. To my joy, he came to Cambodia, and he just changed completely, or the children changed him completely. He was so loved, and um, he was so loving. I was just not the guy I knew growing up. He was, um, it was a wonderful metamorphosis for him. <laughs> and they called him Grandpa, and he was like a grandfather to them. It was a, a really good period. Colin would say, oh, it's absolutely wonderful. He was very, very proud of what Scott was doing. I'm really glad that that happened for him before he passed away, which was last year. And who's, who's the stars that are going to be at the event? Have you oh got God. some names? Um, Chelsea Clinton's going. We now have an Australian office, and uh, when he comes, his head is always in yeah. Cambodia. Should be fine. For him, it's, it's an obsession. Scott hasn't found a life partner. So I booked the dentist for um, quarter to four this afternoon. But somebody always had a girlfriend, as long as we knew him in his previous life. You know, it must be very, very hard for him. About 15 minutes, I'll head out. When I was in Los Angeles, and I was highly sought after, you know, I was the hot commodity. Now that I'm um, 53 year old, and I consider a garbage dump my home, it's not like you don't get your calls taken nearly as much as you used to. got this real urge to be the perfect role model for these kids. I want to be the perfect parent. I want to be the father that they should have had. Seeing the result of what I've done, I can actually take in that, you know, there is a purpose here. It's not just one big abyss. I have nothing left materially. I don't have a car, I don't have um, a house. I couldn't be happier. Touch the flame Where the streets have no